हेलो एवरीबॉडी आपका नमस्ते आत्मा नमस्ते मैम गिव मी अ मोमेंट आत्मा नमस्ते मैम आत्मा नमस्ते आत्मा नमस्ते yes sorry to everyone who's been trying to connect here yesterday and you weren't able to do that sorry i'm just going to mute everybody because there's a lot of talk happening at this point uh, hold on atma namaste sumi atma namaste welcome atma namaste sumi atma namaste we'll give you another minute to uh, get in and then we look at that atma namaste sumi atma namaste 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 welcome atma namaste atma namaste atma namaste thank you sir thank you namaste atma namaste just my question atma namaste to me atma namaste atma namaste to me yes ke here this class ma ke atma namaste good to see you thank you atma namaste just one question we missed yesterday's class ma'am ah uh, yes i know so i'm going to go through it uh, quickly before we do with today's session uh i'm sorry uh, a lot of you i understand was were trying to connect yesterday i had not expected to go beyond a certain number and so i apologize yes uh, for those of you who already heard me yesterday you might have to uh, bear with me repeating again all right um so let's start let's close our eyes connect down to the palate inhale and exhale relax the body we're all here to gather more information about who you and i are we're also here to try and see how this knowledge can be practiced in our daily lives or to make living in this world easier to understand where we came from what we're doing and where we're going feel yourself in the presence of god in the presence of our beloved teacher grand master chua without whom this wouldn't be possible for most of us to all to all the invisible and spiritual helpers thank you feel gratitude respect and love to our beloved teacher grand master chua for all the priceless teachings he has imparted to us because of which most other teachings become easier for us to understand and comprehend mentally say thank you master thank you thank you thank you let's invoke to the supreme being the divine father divine mother to our beloved and respected teacher grand master chua coxwe to lord maha guru ji nailing to buddha kwanin buddha sakyamuni to gautama buddha to the lord christ to yehoshua ba miriam to lord shiva lord ganesha to host of angels ministers the great ones of knowledge light and power to all the great beings of theosophy to our soul and divine self we humbly ask for your great great blessings for your divine light for your light of knowledge of wisdom of understanding of clarity thank you for blessing us with greater accurate perception and correct expression with greater discernment of all the teachings being imparted to us today we ask you to help us absorb and assimilate this knowledge at the same time we ask you to help us to make it part of our lives and use it during this lifetime to become an effective instrument of god and at the same time to make this world a better place we humbly offer ourselves as instruments to do your work with thanks and in full faith so be it so be it so be it be aware of the energy coming down into you inhale exhale release the energy out 
Inhale the energy, exhale. Share this with your family. Thank them for allowing you to stay here for an hour or more. Inhale the energy, exhale. Share it with everyone who has joined us. As one big unit, help us to absorb your divine light, your knowledge, your wisdom. Inhale, exhale, share this energy with the whole world. You may slowly open your eyes with a smile. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the session. The book that we're going to be looking at is the textbook of Theosophy. And so um, let's go there quickly. And so this is the book that we're going to be talking about today, the textbook of Theosophy, written by C.W. Leadbeater. It was written by him in 1912, so more than 100 years ago. And so it's going to give us a basis, especially for those of us who are actually Arhatic yogis. I think this is uh, one of the books that I would recommend you start to read and then move on to the heavier books that Master Choa has given. Because I think uh, Bishop Leadbeater, in the book, um, this particular book, I found that he made the teachings of theosophy much more simple. Simple in the sense that it actually helps us, uh, it actually helps us have uh, I, uh, a better understanding. And this foundation for other theosophy books becomes really, really effective and easy. Yes. And, uh, and so what happens, sorry, let me just mute everybody again. And so what happens is when you start to read the other books, it becomes much easier for you. Now, at the time he wrote this book, he did mention that there were others who had already started reading, uh, sorry, writing books. And this was also uh, with reference to uh, Mr. Uh, Sennett, who had written his book in 1881. So the first book of Theosophy, more or less, that became uh, public to everyone was written at this point uh, by uh, by uh, Mr. Sennett. And there was also Annie Besant who started to write books at this point. However, he says, I'm not going to interfere with those books, but we're going to try and see how we can make it more simple. And so I find that this is a good book to start with. And so that's why we are here. Yeah. Yes. And uh, to sorry, make it easier. All right. One Wow, this is going to be a little difficult. Um, just give me a moment. Aditya, are you on this group? Okay. All right. I'm just trying to see if I can find someone who can do the muting for me. Aditya, is this you? Aditya from Food for the Hungry Foundation, Karnataka. Okay, no idea. All right. So, let me do this. Again. So, me as the host, uh, you have the option to disallow the participants from muting and unmuting them. Uh, correct. It's at the bottom of the participant list on the right hand side, where there are three dots. Yes. Uh, so then none of us will be able to unmute ourselves. Okay, let's see Hello. if it works. Hello. All right. I hope I've done that now. All right. Uh, because I've given the option before I started, but it looks like hopefully it's going to work now. All right. So let's move on. Uh, so starting with, uh, with reference to theosophy, what is theosophy all about? Yes. One of the things to remember is that, the, that when you look at theosophy, it's not a religion by itself. However, the truth that lies behind all religion is the basis of theosophy as well. And so to be more accurate, it would make sense to actually say that theosophy is not just a religion. Yes. So you could say that theosophy is a philosophy, a religion, and a science. It's actually all three. And it has all three aspects in it. And so that's what we're going to look at at this point. And so to move on, when you look at theosophy, looking at it from the perspective of philosophy, we actually try to understand it as saying that 
it gives us the understanding of our scheme of evolution all the way till our solar system. Yes. Now, this solar system, out of which we are only a small part, you you, it actually helps you understand how we came about to this point. Yes. And so the easiest way to say this is to make you and me understand that the whole scheme of evolution from uh, the supreme being or the absolute till now is all mentioned in theosophy, but not just now, but also what is going to come after is also mentioned. And so it is a philosophy in that sense. It, uh, it's uh, explanation of the scheme of evolution of both souls um, and, and also uh, the bodies that are contained in the solar system. That is the planets, um, everything else that you see that are physical are all part of what you will start to understand more as we go um, further into this, yes? Now, secondly, if you look at it, we also talk about it as a religion. Now, what does it mean? It means that during the course of evolution, how do you and I, yes, then move upward in this evolution? If they are saying there is evolution happening, which means you want to become better and better. So is there a pathway that you and I can take to become better or to evolve faster? Yes, and so it says um, there are people who, when they realize that, that there is a path, they want to go faster on it. And therefore, they will put whatever effort they can to try and evolve faster than their brothers and sisters around. Yes, and so that path of evolution is also given. And so it says, and this path has a goal, right? And so that goal is also clearly mentioned in theosophy for us if we want to tread on it. And the next one is with reference to science. Now, science, it's not something where, you know, you're just talking about things, but there is actually direct knowledge and they use both study, investigation and experimentation to try and deduce and come to that particular thing that they're talking about. So it is through experience. It is through study. Uh, experience more from the person or the, the person that is actually trying to go on this path. So all this put together is basically what you talk about theosophy, philosophy, religion, and science. So going back to philosophy, it's the whole evolution of the entire scheme uh, from God till here. And then evolution is the path that they show us that can be taken by any of us to go to a higher level. Yes. Uh, and the last one is anything that they're talking about is it's not just information. But there is, yes, knowledge, which you can study, which you can investigate, which you can experiment, and then uh, figure it out for yourself. There is no blind belief in theosophy. They don't expect you to uh, take on anything that is being said without you actually experiencing or investigating yourself. All right. And so with that, we will go a little bit more into what we're talking about as uh, philosophy. So when you look at theosophy as purely as philosophy, yes, we're talking about this amazing system. We're going to be concentrating on this because the rest of it might be too much, uh, at least at this point. So we're going to just look at our solar system. Yes, this is uh, what we call a carefully ordered mechanism. And uh, it is a manifestation of magnificent life. There's amazing things happening within this that we are not even aware of. However, you and I are just a tiny part of it. Yes. So if you can, first of all, figure out which is Earth <laughs> and then figure out the country you are in and where you are, you'll realize that we are quite small in the scheme of things. Nevertheless, uh, with this, with this uh, part that we're talking about with philosophy, we're going to be looking at our solar system with reference to the past the present and the future to an extent. Yes. And so to make it very, very simple, we'll first move towards the present that we are aware of. Now, in the days that uh, people had religion and understanding of if there was spirituality, if we could call it that, uh, the common way in which they spoke about man, they said that man as was someone who had a soul. Yes. So they assumed that man had a soul. However, it was theosophy that actually reversed this and what you and I understand today, they, they said that you and I are the soul, man is a soul that has a body. It's not the other way around. And not that we have just one body, we have several bodies. 
And each of these bodies are basically what you and I call uh, vehicles or instruments through which we can then go into these other worlds. Now, interestingly, the other worlds also coexist right here and now. It's not that it exists somewhere else. Yes. And so those bodies through which we can access these other worlds exist here and now. Now, interestingly, with, if some of you have already done some sort of studies before, you will notice that uh, you will notice that the teachings actually also talk about each of those having seven layers. Yes. So this body that we refer to is called the physical body. Now, the physical body contains the invisible physical body and the energy body. And then you have what is called the emotional body. And then you have the mental body. Now, each of them have seven layers within it. For us in our present consciousness, we are normally aware of only the lowest of them. That is in our normal waking consciousness. However, when we dream or when we have a trance or when we do a meditation, we might become aware of the existence of these other worlds that surround us and that are here and now, that exist right here, right now. Yes. And um, so it goes on to say that uh, the normal consciousness helps us stay only on the lowest level, though sometimes dreams and trances, he has a glimpse of some of the others. Now, when we talk about death with reference to these bodies, he says death is actually just for a physical person like you and me. We change our clothes every day. So they say death for the soul is just like taking off a coat or your clothes and just moving in to wear another set of clothes. That's it. That's as simple as it is for us. And so this life that you and I have, yes, um, we are using, we the soul are just using this body at this particular point. And there is a reason for using this particular body and we come to that in the course of time. Now, uh, with reference to the past, yes, um, and so we move on from the present. Let's just move on quickly to the past. Let me share that again. And so we have spoken, spoken about man. We realized that the old way was uh, man had a soul, but now we realize the soul is actually the one that has the body. Uh, man is the soul that has a body and several bodies uh, to go with. And uh, so we have... Now your past. Now your past is quite interesting because your past talks about your entire history till where you are right now. Yes, what you have become right now and possibly what you will go into. But more or less this whole thing. Now the evolution of the human race, the evolution of the several races have all been documented, have been recorded and placed there for you and I to access. And this is what you and I call the Akakshic records. And so if you go into that, when you have, you learned and you have access into the Ak Akashic records, you can see the evolution of the human race from the first human race to the second, to the third, and all the sub races that came under it. And so you will know what people did, uh, how people lived, what they understood, whether they were religious and what kind of religious religions existed at that point. So there is a lot to actually understand, even with reference to the past. Now, uh, the other thing to remember is that with reference to you and me, we spoke about, yes, uh, death and we take, it, take off our clothes and move to the next life and then wear on something else. However, it is also mentioned uh, very clearly here that when we come into this life, the life that we have today, from our birth all the way to our death, that whole time that we are here, whether it's 30 years or 70 years or 100 years, this is considered only one day in the life of the soul. And therefore, you and I have had many days, the soul has lived through many, 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 many days. And if you want to understand, you've got to first of all understand that you, you by yourself, the soul, has had a long line of lives and also there has been a long evolution through which you have gone through to reach this particular point in your present life. And so you can't negate what you have already gone through. And it's interesting. I think in one part of the book, it also mentions, it says that um, it talks about if you were aware 
for example, they say Lord Buddha was aware of all his past incarnation. So it says that if you are aware of all your past incarnations, you could then look at your life today and realize that what I am going through today is because of what I did day before yesterday, for example. Yes, you will begin to understand that what I'm having happen to me, say, for example, right now uh, with my relationships or with my wealth or with my uh, or with my health. Yes, is purely because of what transpired in my life at this point. Right. And so uh, one of the things I remember Master Cho sharing with us, and uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, he said that you and I, especially if we are right now on the spiritual path and we're trying to evolve more and more, we are soldiers on the spiritual path. Yeah, most of us are soldiers right now on the spiritual path, trying to fight our limitations and weaknesses and go further. You see, because you've been trained as a soldier in a previous lifetime, you have that determination and you have the will to say, you know what, I am going to go. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to uh, do whatever it takes to be able to do this for my king or uh, destroy what is required in order to g gain what is required for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the kingdom, for example. But in doing so, sometimes uh, you've got to remember you and I have not been as good as we are today. Not that we are all perfectly good. We can't be perfectly good. However, we would have done some act in that past. Yes, whether it was day before yesterday, whether it was last week, seven days ago or 10 years ago, 10 days ago, sorry. So if you're looking at days, that, that's what we're looking at. So say, for example, you were that soldier at a particular point and you had to go to war and you had to uh, kill people, you had to destroy lives, homes, yes? Now, when you do this purely as the duty, yes, to your king or to your kingdom, there is no karma. And that's what Master Cho also mentioned with reference to the conversation that uh, Lord Krishna had, yes? Uh, now, uh, when, uh, when Arjuna was there, at, uh, though he was on the, at the war zone, he did not really want to go out there and kill his so-called um, teachers and family. But uh, Lord Krishna says, when you do this purely as your duty, there is no karma involved. And so coming back to you and I being soldiers, if we were soldiers at that point, if we did our work purely as duty to the king, no problem today. But sadly, for most people at that point, they started to enjoy what they were doing. That is killing or stabbing or doing things. And so um, this is something that I, that I started to understand uh, both from our teacher and from some of the Acharyas. And so they say what happens is at this present lifetime, you might have chosen then to take care of that karma that you created at that point. Yes. And so uh, one of them was sharing that uh, when she was a soldier, uh, she was kind of very short. And what she would do is when the enemy would try and come in, she would take the spear and pierce it like this, you know, because she was shot into the chest. And she would keep doing that to all of them. And she realized that was the reason why she had a problem with her heart. Yes. Um, another person uh, uh, who mentioned this uh, to us, um, I remember Master Cho was doing the healing and then she started to cry. And uh, later on, when we asked what happened, and she says, you know, during that time, she had her whole memory of a previous incarnation where she was a Roman soldier. And uh, when, when the enemy soldiers would go on their horses, she would take her sword and just cut all their legs. Yes. Uh, the point, like I said, if it was purely duty, it's no problem. But when you start to enjoy it, there is karma involved. And so at a very tender age of 13, she started to develop arthritis and she still has arthritis. And so the point is, whatever we've done in our past will catch up in our present. And so the point is, if we start to understand this is how the scheme of life is, maybe we will be able to accept our present better, right? And so uh, keeping in mind what I spoke about Lord Buddha, and so at that point, uh, when Lord Buddha was walking, someone there said something very nasty to him. And uh, he told his disciples, it is okay, in a previous life, lifetime, I have not been very nice to him. So let it be, let it go. Right? So when we have people who say things about us, uh, they make stories about us. When we have people who cheat us, uh, who take money away, and uh, people who have uh, caused injury on other levels in our lives, we have to realize 
nothing in our life happens if it was not already planted by us in the past. Yes. So what are we talking about? We're basically saying that everything that you are going through today in this lifetime, which is your one day, is got to do with whatever action you created in a past. So this is the reaction of an action in the past, if that makes sense to you. Yes, I will give you time to ask questions a little later. Let me just try. I think I'm going slower today. Yesterday, I almost finished. All right. So uh, <laughs> keeping in mind, so this is basically what we're talking about. That is with reference to you. At the same time, since we all are in this world, this world has also been evolving. And sometimes we wonder, you know, when we see this whole thing about the coronavirus or the COVID-19 and you wonder what is going to happen to the earth, what is going to happen to the people on the globe, the political situation, the economical situation, there's going to be so much changes that none of us are aware of. But they say, be assured that the world is not going into uh, some kind of, uh, let me use the words of the book. I, I really like the words here. Let me use the words if I can find it. the past. Okay, I can't seem to find it right now. Yes, the world is not drifting blindly. Its progress is under the control of a perfectly organized hierarchy so that the final failure, even for the tiniest of its units, is of all impossibilities the most impossible. A glimpse of the working of that hierarchy inevitably engenders the desire to cooperate with it, to serve under it in however humble a capacity you and I can, and sometime in the far distant future to be worthy to join the outer fringes of its ranks. Yes, and so if you and I start to understand that there is a scheme, there is a, a plan, yes, and there is a hierarchy that takes care of everything, then maybe even the smallest things that we do, for example, you've done the Twin Hearts to Bless the Earth today, or you've done the Great Invocation for your, uh, for your area, uh, you will start to notice that, I hope you can still hear me, um, you will still notice that based on all this information that you have, you will be able to go through this smoothly. And the little works that you do to bless, to heal someone, will actually add, yes, uh, to the scheme of or the plan of the great one and somewhere in the future they will start to realize because you continue to do this and you will not stop you will want to do more and more and more and as you do that you will hope to do more and more that is in line with this plan and not against the plan and as you go closer and closer to the plan then you will become what is called a member of the outer ring yes or the outer circle of this great plan that's where I think we all will probably want to go. Yes. So we not only know the plan, not only understand the plan, but we start to become part of that plan. Yes. Um, now, the other thing is once we start to understand this based on what I just said, they say that one of the most striking advantages of theosophy is that the light which it brings to us at once solves many of our problems, clears away many difficulties, accounts for the apparent injustices in life and in all directions brings order out of the seeming chaos. Yes. And so to understand that this whole thing that's happening to the globe even right now is part of that scheme. We can't understand uh, maybe fully, but I think one of the things that you realize, uh, which I mentioned even yesterday, is if you look at it, everybody practically uh, all over the globe are with their family. And it's a time that most people do not spend with their family. Yes, uh, in India, I think we finished almost 35 days. To be able to live in the same house with the same members every day is sometimes a challenge for people. Yes, uh, some kids like my son is very happy to have mom and dad at home, but he does find me more busy than when I used to go to the office. But the point is they enjoy that and there is a lot more bonding happening within families. Yes, uh, women who did not do baking and cooking on a regular basis today are making cakes and cookies and including me, uh, you know, which you don't get to do, but that is the memory your child or your family is going to have. So these 35 days, or I think in our case, it's going to be about 45 days plus, is going to be something that everyone will remember. 
and there is good that will come out of it. Now, also remember, uh, for example, we have been blessing Mother Earth. Yes, uh, one is for the COVID, uh, one is for the Grego that's been created of stress and all kinds of other things. People are power hungry. All this is going to uh, affect the world. But our energy is hopefully that little spark of light that you send to the earth every day will make a change. Yes, we've been blessing Mother Earth with a good earth, good air, good water. And uh, I think we've definitely achieved good air. <laughs> the pollution levels everywhere including in the city of uh, Delhi, for example, or in uh, many of these uh, recently affected cities, I think will come down drastically. In, in some cases, probably it will be a record in history that we have actually brought it down to this level. Yes. So there are plus and minus, but there is something that is happening at this point, And hopefully it is going to get the human, human race to a higher, higher evolutionary level. Because I think everything is always going upwards. Yes, evolution is upwards, it's not downwards. So hopefully this is going to be a plus point for this particular time that we're all going through. Right? Uh, now, based on what I was talking about, now there are certain people, when they start to understand the scheme, will start to say, hey, you know what? I want to go faster on this path. And so they will, they will have to tread a much more steep, difficult path. Now, Master Cho has also mentioned when we talk about Arhatic Yoga, when you want to spiritually evolve, you can take the road, yes, and slowly go up to the top of the hill. But these people that we're referring to actually want to climb the sides of the hill and go up, which is much more steep and more difficult. However, they say when they reach the top, they say this was worth it. Yes, all the trouble, all the difficulty we went through was definitely, uh, definitely fruitful. And they also say that uh, the, the bodies, you remember we spoke about the different bodies, the vehicles uh, that they have, they say that the limitations of these various vehicles are thereby gradually transcended and the liberated man becomes an intelligent co-worker in the mighty plan of the evolution of all beings. Yes. And so um, this is basically what starts happening uh, to the entire, to the entire, um, if you can call uh, group of people who've gone ahead of us. None of them, if you meet them, will say, you know what, I want to go back to my normal life with my family and, you know, my big house and my big factories. They'll say, no, we're very happy where we are. But you don't have to rush yourself. Master Cho says, every fruit has its own time to ripen. Yes. And so don't push yourself too fast, too quickly. Let it happen, let it come. And that's the same thing even with us, whether we are pranic healers out there or arhatic yogis, let's not push other people into the school. Yes, you realize, yes, there's a lot that the, the, the teachings of the school could give to people around you, your friends and others included. But remember that if they are not ready for it, if the fruit is not ripe enough, they may not like what you share with them. They definitely wouldn't like the class. And so what happens is they might actually step back or even go out of the school, which is not what you want. Yeah. So give them time. Um, I've known people when um, I used to take the basic class, um, when we would ask them, you know, how did you hear about pranic healing? And there were people say, I heard about it 10 years ago. I went for an intro talk five years ago and I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> uh, you can't imagine that, you know, something, it's like a seed that is left in those souls and then at some point it, it kind of bears fruit and then the person lands up in your basic class or you suddenly see them uh, you know after a couple of years and you say wow uh, I've had friends from um, my childhood days and uh, now they, they're erhatic yogis and I'm like I can't believe this person is an erhatic yogi uh, I have a, a relative uh, who's no longer in his body but I would never think that uncle of mine would ever get into pranic healing right but the things that he would share and the things that he would say, I realize I can understand why and how he actually uh, automatically was drawn towards uh, Master Choi's teachings. Yes. So let's move on. So this is basically talking about uh, the philosophy. Uh, so now let's go a little bit more into the next one and move into. So we were talking about the past uh, and then we spoke about um, this is the whole philosophy part. And then we're going into religion. Now, when we talk about religion, yes, uh, theosophy as a religion, first is to understand that at no part does theosophy ever expect anybody 
to follow the teachings blindly. Right? And so uh, it goes on to show us, it says here, first, it does not demand you to follow them. Yes. And then it says, the occult student, uh, we, they don't call us spiritual aspirants in theosophy, they call us occult students or uh, students of occult sciences. Either knows because of personal experience, a thing or suspends his judgment about it till he actually finds the time to experience it till then he keeps it on hold. Yes, either he knows or if he hasn't reached it, he does. Now for a beginner, what he or she does is he will read the accounts of all the people who've gone before him. There is a, hypo a hypothesis that he keeps in his mind. But again, for him, until and unless he is able to experience and understand for himself, investigate for himself, it doesn't become part of his uh, knowledge to follow. And secondly, as it's written there, theosophy never endeavors to convert any man from whatever religion. Now, personally, for me, I found that once I did uh, understand the teachings of theosophy and Grand Massachusetts, my understanding of my own religion started to deepen. And I started to understand why they would do certain things. I would understand the meaning of prayers better, uh, why we would chant, and what should I actually look for in a chant, and also how to say a prayer. Yes, uh, when I was a little girl, I, you know, we used to have a big joint family. And I remember my grandmother, I guess, being uh, a matriarchal society, she would start off with the prayers. And all I can remember, I'm talking about maybe being a three or four, and all I can, you know, the sound sounds something like this. And I'm like, what are they saying? Because obviously I can't understand the language because they're reciting it so fast. But all I know is for half an hour, they would all sit, all the men and women, <laughs> married, not married, all of them would sit and we kids would be, you know, walking around trying to figure out what are these people reciting every night without fail. Yes, uh, this was something that they would do. But today I understand better and I realize if I could say that one prayer properly, it's equivalent to that half an hour of what they were doing. Not that what they were doing was not bad. It was definitely effective and I'm sure it brought about a lot of blessings to our family. Uh, but the point is for me, uh, what they mention here is it starts to explain your religion and enables us to have a deeper meaning of what is to be recited, what is to be done and what is to be known. And this deeper understanding in many cases helps them uh, become more intelligent and their faith in their religion is never lost. Now for me, I think it's not just my own religion, but I started to respect and understand many other religions. Um, also, as a, as a school student, I would always want to know what was the similarity between my religion and the other religion. I wasn't looking for differences. I always wanted to know what was similar. And it was interesting to start finding this little thread that continued uh, to kind of join many of the religions. And I thought that was quite interesting at that age. Anyway, so uh, coming back. Now, we were talking about uh, theosophy as a philosophy, as a relig religion. Now, let me just end with it being a science. So theosophy has its aspect also with science. It's definitely a science. So the statement uh, that we would like to make here is that everything that we talk about, yes, uh, whatever we've been talking about, it cannot be too often repeated that its statements on all these matters are not vague guesses or tenets of faith, but are based upon direct or often repeated observation of what actually happened. Its investigations have dealt also to a certain extent with subjects more in the range of ordinary science. Yes, and this has all been written in occult chemistry. And uh, so when you start to look at what has been written, you will realize that they have repeated over and over again in many books by many authors, the same thing. And of course, there are a lot of them who are clairvoyant. And once you can start seeing into the inner world and you can actually see partially, I'm talking about the highly evolved ones who are clairvoyant, yeah? I'm not talking about our friends and people around us who are clairvoyant. We're talking about these very highly evolved uh, aspirants on the spiritual path who are clairvoyant who are able to see beyond and because of what they can see beyond uh, and the description of what uh, comes in these books, it's, it's amazing because then you cannot forget about what exists around you. Yes, uh, I remember reading these books. I, I once did a course on Vipassana for 10 days. You're not supposed to talk. 
And so I carried one of these theosophy books um, and I enjoyed reading it. It was like a thick book and I finished it in those days. But the information was like reading a fairy tale book, you know, with all these little beings that did all these amazing things. But anyway, coming back to what we're talking about, uh, more or less, I'm going to go to the end of chapter one. And then I'm going to ask you uh, if you have questions and then maybe we'll stop today. <laughs> I know some of you have heard it yesterday, but <laughs> let me just stop here. Uh, though I have... All right. And so in philosophy, they actually talk about uh, these, these great truths or these three great facts. Yes. Very simply put is what I've written there. They ultimately, with all the information that they have, they realize that there's only one thing that's common and it's common in all religions. It's not just that it's written only in this particular spiritual book. It is written in all spiritual books about it. It's written in all religious texts as well. And so it goes to say that God is good. You and I are immortal. And the law of karma, which says what you sow, you will reap. Yes. And no religion disputes these so let me just read uh, these three facts in, uh, let me quote it directly from here, yeah? Because I think the words are quite interesting as well. So it says that the three truths, the soul of man is immortal and its future is the future of a thing whose growth and splendor has no limit. And so you and I as a soul, as we start to evolve, our limit is unlimited. Yes, um, and we'll understand why it's unlimited when we go to the next chapter. The second one, the principle which gives life dwells in us and without us or around us. It's undying and eternally beneficent, is not heard or seen or smelt, but is perceived by man who desires perception. So as you start to evolve, you get closer and closer uh, to understanding this great being, uh, probably to an extent also being aware of the potency of the energy of this great being and uh, also uh, allowing that energy from the great being to be brought down into the physical realm. Each man is his own absolute lawgiver. Sorry, let me just stop that. Is his own law, absolute lawgiver, the dispenser of glory, or gloom to himself, the decreer of his own life, his reward and his punishment. Yes. So we are the ones who actually create uh, our present, the way we're going to live our lives, all the things that are going to come into our lives at this point, whether it's going to be happiness, whether it's going to be uh, lessons that we want to learn, might be tough lessons, but we have decided to do this for ourselves. Yep. And so um, to end with the first chapter, let me just add a few more lines. There is a definite scheme of things. It is under intelligent direction, the direction of the hierarchy, and works under immutable laws. Man has his place in the scheme and is living under these laws. And so no matter where you come from, whether you live in India, whether you live in the Middle East, whether you live in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in America, the law of karma applies to all of us, regardless, regardless of our religion, regardless of where we are in this universe, in this solar system, I think it works. Yes. So whether you take a, a rocket and go all the way to Neptune, it will still work. It's the same law that applies to you and me. It doesn't change. All right. <clears throat> if he understands, if he understands them and cooperates with them, he will advance rapidly and will be happy. If he does not understand them, if wittingly or unwittingly he breaks them, he will delay his progress and be miserable. These are not theories, but proved facts. Let him who doubts read on and he will see. Yes. So that's the end <laughs> of chapter one. I hope you found it interesting and I hope it has been simplified for you. That's the reason why we are doing this, just to try and help simplify these uh, amazing teachings that uh, you and I have. Yeah, so that ends chapter one. Uh, we'll see if we want to go into chapter two. It's already uh, quite a long time. It's almost 15 minutes of listening to me. 
So I am going to uh, allow people now to ask questions if you like. We'll have a few minutes. Uh, let me give you that option first. Yes, okay. So does anybody have a question before I go ahead? Uh, so me? Neeta, right? Yes, it's Neeta. Yeah, Atma yes, Namaste. Neeta. Atma Namaste. Tell me, Neeta. Yeah, somebody had already asked the question. How okay. do we... You're breaking up. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. You were breaking up. How do we neutralize our karma this lifetime? Of all the past lifetimes, you know, whatever we are carrying now. <laughs> all right. Okay, don't try to take care of everything of your previous lifetime in this lifetime. Remember, it's only one day. And how much can you handle in one day? It's not possible. So whatever you have happening in your lifetime right now, uh, the things that Master Choa says is with reference to the three things, is the first thing that you need to do with your relationship is learn to forgive. One of the most important things, uh, I'm going to repeat myself for some of you who've heard me before, but remember forgiving, when you forgive someone who's doing something to you, he or she is not doing it to you for the first time. It's probably because of what you have done in your past. And so that yeah. past is catching up with you. And so to that person, you actually have to say, listen, thank you. Because of what you're doing to me, my present, yes, my present karma is getting neutralized. At the same time, the second thing to remember is this is happening to you because you have done it to someone in your past, in your yesterday or last week. And so you need to also ask for forgiveness from that person in your past saying, listen, I understand now what I've done to you. So for whatever I've done, there is no excuse. Forgive me. And to the person who's doing it to you at this point, say, thank you for doing this. You have helped me neutralize my karma. Now, remember when they do that to you, what happens to their karma? Neeta. Yes, I'm yes, right here. No, no, I know. So when these people do these things to you, which are not very pleasant and very nice, what happens to their karma? Uh, they are creating negative karma. Correct. So their negative karma increases, whereas yours reduces. So this reminds me of the story that Master Chor used to talk about, uh, which is a true story about this uh, Lama who was trying to, uh, this Tibetan Lama who was trying to come down from Tibet into India. But as he was traveling down to India, on the way, the Chinese soldiers catch him. And then he's taken in and he's been tortured every day. They try to pull out his nail, his hair. They really torture him. And in the end, they let him go. And he does come down to India. And he has an audience with the Dalai Lama. Now, at the time, of the, uh, at the time that he was with the Dalai Lama, he shared this story with everyone. And sorry, the others, could you just uh, mute yourself, please? If you can just put that blue hand, I'll come to you as I answer uh, Nita's question, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yes, and so what happens is um, when you look at uh, the story and uh, he, he shares this with the audience and he leaves. And the audience, at the end of the story, uh, the uh, Tibetan monk, he says, during my time there, I was so worried I would lose compassion. I would lose compassion for the, uh, I'm sorry, one second. I, I'm finding uh, a little bit of too much noise there again. Okay, sorry. So the story goes where he's sitting and he shares it. And at the end he says, I'm so worried I'm going to lose compassion for the soldiers. And after which he leaves the room and the people there, the audience, are quite confused by what he said at the end. And so they asked the Dalai Lama, what did he mean by that? And so the Dalai Lama continues to explain. He says, you see, when those soldiers started to pluck his nails and pull his hair and torture him and whip him, they actually helped him reduce his negative karma to neutralize it. But he had to have compassion to these soldiers because in what they did to him, yes, they neutralized his uh, negative karma, but they actually increased his negative karma, their own negative karma. Because not only were they causing injury to this person, but he was a very evolved Lama. So when you do it to someone who's more evolved, the, what's coming back is much more than just once. So 
that was a story I remember Master Chua says, and he says, you need to learn to forgive others. And for me, um, I took it to this next level where I realized when someone does something to me, it's because I have done it. Maybe this lifetime I've never done it, but I have definitely done it at some point. So to that person, ask for forgiveness. And to the person who's doing it to you, say thank you and I forgive you for what you have done. I hope that helps you with reference to um, the first part, which is relationship. Now, the other thing with relationship is also to love people unconditionally. Loving and practicing that on a higher level is really something that is tough for many of us. We hopefully have become more loving than before, but you realize your family, especially now in these 35 days, they will test you. <laughs> if you don't have anyone around, you're very lucky. <laughs> but for those of us who are around, we have enough people to test us to see how much more loving and kind can we actually become. Yes. Uh, so the, one of the first few lessons is with reference to relationships. And so it's love. Uh, the second is forgiveness. And the third one with relationship is accept people for who they are. You know that she is going to come and say these things to you. You know that's going to happen. Accept it that this is what she's going to do. This is what she's going to say. Once you accept them, accept them for who, you, who they are, sorry, you will notice that they don't bother you as much. But every time you get affected when that person comes, you haven't learned your lesson yet. Yes. yes. Uh, and sometimes loving kindness is also to yourself. You need to stand up for yourself. <laughs> you have to stand up for what is right. <laughs> so um, that wraps up uh, loving kindness. Uh, sorry, with, with reference to relationships. Uh, the second lesson that we usually have to learn with karma is with reference to our health, for example. And so anything that you start to endure, whether you are 50 and you have an issue with your heart or whether you are 13 like that lady and you have arthritis or whether you started to work and then you suddenly have issues with your skin. The, there, there could be factors in your present life that are causing it. But also remember part of it, why it's occurring in your body uh, is also because of what happened in your past. And so the past is also catching up with reference to that part of your body being the weakest. Yes. And so when that part becomes the weakest, it's because of something that you've done earlier. So if you start to heal people with similar issues, you will notice that that part of the body starts to heal itself. Yes, it starts becoming better. You can breathe better. You can walk better. So there is something got to do with your past that's catching up. Now, for example, they say smoking will actually or can cause cancer. How come it doesn't happen to everyone? Because yes, though it is uh, probably something that's not very healthy to take, it doesn't affect everyone the same way because of their karmas. Yes. Similarly, you and I all come from the same family, same parents. But yes. your brother, your sister and you, all of us have different lives. One is doing well, one is not doing too well, one has a health issue, the other one has perfectly healthy. Yes, so it, it changes with everyone because of karma. And so we have to, one, with reference to health, if, if possible, heal others. If not, you need to tithe on a regular basis to people, preferably in that area where you're having trouble with your body. Yes, so when you direct the, the karma towards that, then that karma from that point will come back to you in that same area or that same part of the body that you have an issue with. Yes. And uh, the last one is with reference to your wealth. Again, if you are born into a family which is very prosperous, but now you are not very prosperous, you need to wonder why that cycle went like that. So that could be one. It could be the other way around as well. You came from a very, very poor background, but you realize everyone struggled and you came up. Now, how come you came up? So Master Chua says, if you look at the history of usually the Asians, uh, the Indians and the Chinese being the largest uh, communities, he says, if you look at them, they all saved. If you look at your ancestors, if you look at your fathers, if you look at your forefathers, they all saved and lived a very simple life. And so the point is to save for wealth. And the second, if you are going through financial karma, you have to tithe. I know you don't have money now, which means your negative karma is already up here. So you have to learn to tithe. It might be a small amount. You have to keep tithing and tithing and tithing and tithing and tithing. It might be one year, five years. It's still catching up. And then it becomes okay. Right? And so if you do not have that problem in your life, please don't stop tithing. Please tithe. Because if that is coming, so say for example, right now your life is like this. But the karma of financial karma is coming here. If you've been tithing regularly, and this is the karma, you may go through it, but it's a very short bit. 
You understand what I'm saying? So you need to learn to tie it, whether it's your business, whether it's your personal thing, you need to tie it on a regular basis. Regularity is very important. Tithing once in a year is good. Uh, but one of the things, I think it was Acharya Dani who mentioned. So if you look at tithing like this for 12 months and you did your tithing of say a uh, hundred thousand rupees in January, yes, and you have negative karma that comes. So because your tithing is so high and your good karma is so high, the first few months goes pretty, you know, you have no issues, all good, even COVID, no issues. <laughs> and then you, you go into July and then you go down and you start realizing the latter part of your life uh, during the year becomes tough. Mm -hmm. Financially speaking, yes. So you need to do it regularly. The amount is not as important, Master says. It is the regularity that is important. So if you can go into that, that would really, really help. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that I'd like to add here is, um, it's also, it was also in the talk that was given last month by Master Chur, where he says, in order to do this, you have to learn to budget. Mm -hmm. If you cannot budget, you are not going to tithe. You're not going to save. So um, the, the, the Tao's teaching is basically what is called the 30-10 rule, which means you have to save 30% of whatever you earn every month annually, and you have to type 10%. That takes away 40% of your earnings. So can you live with 60%? Mm. And um, to me personally, I remember at the time he asked me, he said to me, uh, how much are you saving? I said, Master, as per your guidelines, I've been working on 30%. He says, you're single. And at that point, uh, I was still with my parents. So he says, you're single and you live with your parents. You have to learn to save 40%. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. And this is something we need to start teaching our youngsters because uh, from our forefathers or our grandparents' generation or parents' generation and the new generation, I'm not too sure about saving. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you really have to learn to save. That is very important. 30, 10. So that hopefully answers uh, the karma bit which uh, which will be coming to all our lives and please do not ask to handle all your karmas and there was this one person who did that she went for a retreat asked for it and when she came back home life became so crazy her health mm -hmm. became an issue she was very very young in her 20s she had issues with uh, the law with reference to uh, a court uh, court case with her ex-husband uh, she had problems with money being stolen uh, she was kidnapped there were all kinds of crazy things that happened to her life Yes, till she realized what she asked for. So when you ask, it will be given. Be ready. <laughs> I know I said people would want to evolve faster. But remember, you and I are also living in, in a city with people around us. We have family responsibilities and we have work responsibilities. So all that needs to be considered when we look at taking on more. Yes. Okay, guys, it's one hour. <laughs> Thank you. One hour. I can't believe it's been one hour. <laughs> So um, I'm going to continue tomorrow uh, with chapter two. Uh, so if you do have others who want to join, just ask them to finish reading chapter one and they can join uh, with chapter two. That is from the absolute to us, the human being, or what we call from the absolute to man. Okay. Yes, uh, if you have questions, let's keep it for tomorrow if you don't mind. I think otherwise it gets too long and all of us have to go back to our families to have dinner. I wouldn't want to cause any negative karma. <laughs> <laughs> for you or for me. <laughs> so uh, let's end right now. Please close your eyes. Um, I do be Sorry, ma'am. Whoever is talking, I can't hear you because you're breaking up. Ma'am, ID will be this. Ma'am, I'm saying tomorrow session. Yes, uh, the ID will remain like this for the rest uh, till we finish this book. And if we have time to go to the next book. Uh, so please come back to this ID from 6.30 onwards, we'll start. From 6 to, um, 6 to about uh, 6.29, hopefully, I'm actually doing the Twin Hearts and the Great Invocation uh, with the other group, with the old ID that you had, all right? So let's close our eyes. Connect down to your palate. Feel gratitude, respect, and love to all the beings. To all the priceless teachings, to all the knowledge being given to us, let's end with a thanksgiving to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokok, Sweet Lord, Maha Guruji Meling, to all the great ones, to all the holy masters, holy gurus, healing ministers, healing angels, 
to all the beings of knowledge, light and power, to all the invisible helpers, to our soul and divine self, we thank you all for your great, great blessings. Thank you for helping us gain greater knowledge and a deeper understanding of your teachings, of the scheme of evolution. We ask you to continue to help us to use these teachings to make our lives better and become a better divine servant. We thank you in full faith. We thank you with gratitude, with respect, with much love. We thank you. Atma Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being with us. We'll start tomorrow. Uh, since we have time for people to join in, we'll give you about 10 minutes or five minutes or so. So the questions that you have, if you can please write it down in your books. Tomorrow when we begin, we'll begin with your questions. Uh, so we finish off with chapter one and then we move into chapter two. Yes. Thank, Thank you for the wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Enjoy your dinner. Bon appetit to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.